There we go. Yeah, is there? We're, we're up and running. Uh, a very good afternoon, evening, and possibly morning in some cases to all of you out there. It's uh, lovely to see you. Look at the map below. You can see we've got a, a good representation of the world with us. Uh, we've got four continents represented, which is fantastic. So it's lovely to see you. Welcome to this Eden Knapp webinar about accessibility and inclusion in this uh, pandemic time. My name is Alistair Creelman. I work at Linnaeus University in Kalmar in the southeast of Sweden. Uh, you can zoom in on the map and find out where that is. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this session. So I will sort of introduce and I will leave it to our guest speakers who have a lot of important things to tell you. I can say also that uh, you are able to post questions and comments in the chat. You can chat with each other. And uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, I'd like to ask our two speakers to introduce themselves briefly. Uh, first of all, Antony Lepoche, who's a, a, fellow, a fellow Eden fellow and uh, is uh, assist Associate Professor at the Department of Education at Universita Roma 3. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you for, for your introduction. Uh, I just wanted to, um, to, to say, I would tell some, something more regarding myself, but uh, first of all, I wanted to, um, to introduce this event as one that is uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the uh, network of academics and professional series. Uh, Eden uh, has uh, uh, this possibility of uh, uh, promoting a series of professional development activities within the network of academics and professionals, uh, which uh, supports uh, networking of individual members of the association, of course, provide a highly effective meeting and communication forum. And it's coordinated by a steering committee that is, has been um, recently uh, uh, renewed, renovated, and uh, um, it uh, uh, provides information for members on the opportunities for professional uh, actions, how to build up a, a personal portfolio, including documents, resources, but first of all, promotes communication and networking. So it's a, a good opportunity for all of us to meet uh, also on events like the one we are going to have today, uh, finding new uh, new uh, uh, opportunities for research, development and growth. Uh, that's for sure. The idea is to have a, a large uh, community where we all take part and being part uh, of the Eden as uh, member institutions can uh, help you also participate in the different uh, conferences, uh, have reduced fees uh, and uh, possibilities to really take part uh, in this huge and important community. Uh, as we said, we have different kind of events within the network of academics and professionals, uh, webinars for sure, but also um, uh, um, uh, possibilities to to have uh, uh, and to interact on on social media uh, the other thing that I wanted to tell you but maybe we can remind it also uh, at the end of the event Alistair I think you agree with me is to remind all of you of uh, uh, the uh, annual conference that is going to take place this year O o online, it goes virtual, of course. It is hosted by Polytechnica University Timisoara, uh, based in Timisoara, and it will take place uh, from June 21st to June 24th. And the topic is human and artificial intelligence for the society of the future. So it's a very, very uh, interesting and uh, uh, involving topic and I really hope you all uh, can take part in the conference because lots of very interesting papers will be uh, presented uh, uh, during the conference. 
That was was my introduction. Uh, yes, as you said, I teach experimental pedagogy at the University of Roma 3, Department of Education. I've been involved in technology um, in education for several years now, and uh, I've been um, you know, uh, supporting uh, the association for for many, many, many years actually, and have been part of uh, uh, the uh, Eden uh, NAP network of academics and professionals, uh, um, being uh, the chair of uh, of uh, the steering committee for the last mandate. As I said, now uh, there's a new steering committee. Uh, I've seen from participants that some of the steering committee members are there. So I thank Vlad, uh, first of all, and Francesca, I think, is there somewhere. Anyway, um, we can start uh, talking about the topic uh, uh, for today. Uh, we just... Uh, so, sorry, Alistair, please. Uh, could we just uh, let Paul say a few words, just to, because he's... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Paul, actually, actually I, thought, I thought you were going to introduce him. Um, yeah. Uh, Paul yeah, is... Paul is uh, Assistant Dean and Chief Technology Officer at Stanford University in California, and he hasn't got visual contact, but we can hear him. So, Paul, can you just say a few words about yourself, and then Antonella can start... Session. Well, thank you, Alistair and, and Antonella, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful seminar. I remember doing a keynote at one of the Eden uh, events in Ireland. I don't know how many years ago that was, but I wonder if any of the participants today uh, saw me there when I was in Ireland. Actually, I saw you, and I remember very oh, well your keynote presentation. Yeah. <laughs> many years ago, so time goes by very fast. Well, at Stanford, I'm in charge of a few different programs. First of all, I uh, experiment courses uh, with uh, uh, MOOCs, and then I also have a team of uh, people doing ed tech solutions, developing ed tech solutions and experimenting them. And then we also have an entrepreneur in residence program. We invite uh, experts from the industry to come in and advise our faculty and students with uh, ed tech uh, innovations and invention, things like that. So. Uh, I hope that uh, you will enjoy my presentation later today, and then I'll be uh, happy to answer all of your questions. So thank you. Okay, thank so well, uh, <clears throat> nice. We'll hear from Paul in a little while, and uh, I'll just let Antonella get ready for. I'll just move the the view so that we can see her presentation, and the topic is accessibility and inclusion, and. Uh, one of the we have enormous opportunities for online learning in the world but sadly a lot of the people in the world who need online learning and need open online learning don't know it exists or can't get on board because they lack infrastructure and there are other disadvantages in the that prevent them from taking advantage of this uh, what's on offer so antonella the floor is yours Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you very much for your introduction. Yes, this is one of the uh, main issues that we have been experiencing uh, during this, uh, this uh, lockdown that uh, in a way or another uh, really harmed all of us all over all over the world and from what I see from the places where the audience is based today I can I can tell that uh, the problem that this kind of issue is felt uh, all, all over the world in in different ways maybe but it's it's a problem that regards us all. Uh, so uh, how uh, we 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 are going to to discuss uh, this issue today. Uh, what kinds of, of solutions are available to ensuring ongoing education for mar marginalized groups? This is a very hot topic. It's difficult to answer uh, this question for sure. Uh, there are different ways that we can uh, put forward to, to, to work uh, on that, to give uh, a solution. Um, there are open educational initiatives. 
uh, different kind of projects are developed within within this uh, uh, this area. Uh, the, you can see here in this slide uh, a logo related to open virtual mobility, and this is related to uh, a project that we have been working on. Um, it's a European project coordinated by Beirut University in Germany. And it's a project where, uh, for instance, uh, open virtual mobility issues are uh, promoted and in a, a way um, uh, supporting virtual mobility, uh, we can cope with certain kind of limited uh, ac uh, accessibility. Uh, another uh, possible uh, solution uh, to uh, the question that I highlighted here is related to personalized and adaptable uh, learning. So building learning scenarios and paths uh, personalized for, for specific specific kinds of targets. And this is what we have been working on in another project that is called Inclusive Memory that was coordinated by the Center for Museum Studies that I chair uh, um, in my university at the Department of Education. If you want to know more about that, we can talk about it uh, later and I can also give you some link to the to the project website, where we uh, worked on devising uh, specific uh, uh, learning scenarios for specific uh, um, uh, marginalized targets, always supported by um, by cultural um, valued uh, environments. So museum and heritage are uh, always uh, centered as, um, you know, what I call uh, frank zones where, uh, you know, culture and uh, uh, can be supportive in helping accessibility. Always, you know, in digitally uh, enhanced uh, situations. Um, but what is the risk that we have been experiencing during this time of, uh, uh, of a pandemic, during this lockdown time? Um, the problem, the issue is educational poverty. I don't know if you have uh, experienced it, how did you experience it, but as you can see from this uh, uh, definition, uh, educational poverty is defined as the impossibility for children and teenagers to learn, experiment, develop, and freely foster their capacities, their talents, and aspirations. The pandemic really made us um, face uh, these kind of difficulties. Um, maybe uh, in places of the world, in, in especially in the Western world, where uh, you know, we couldn't have the real dimension of what educational poverty mean, or, or at least not so directly. There are different areas also in my country where this kind of educational poverty is experienced, is absolutely uh, live, and we should work to, to face uh, and to contrast it. Um, but uh, the lockdown, the pandemic, for sure, highlighted this, uh, this situation and highlighted the difficulties of uh, um, uh, access education uh, where, uh, you know, limits to technology are experienced. I'm, I'm so glad that Paul Kim, in a while, will tell you more about their there are projects that are based on, on this subject in very remote areas, so you will give you a, a, a hint from, from that. Um, another uh, issue is uh, how do we handle situations where students do not have access to the internet and or to technologies, further expanding the digital divide? And this is what is actually related to what I was mentioning before. Uh, again, different problems to be coped with. Um, we need 
see the support from different stakeholders uh, to find a solution. Um, of course, governments uh, put forward uh, funding to provide digital technologies. In Italy, uh, we had uh, um, uh, support from from the minister, uh, from the ministry, in order to to give um, tablet devices. Actually, you know, uh, devices. Uh, to our uh, pupils who were um, not able to to connect because they didn't have any device at home. Of course, that is one point, but it's not the solution. Uh, other possibilities are related to agreement with tech companies, libraries, museums, uh, on and offline volunteers. Uh, uh, to provide sources and necessary skills to access to educational resources. Uh, but again, uh, you know, this kind of agreements can take time to be uh, started, can, you know, face different kind of, uh, of um, limitations. So we need also to think of uh, a bottom-up uh, way to uh, find uh, solutions and cope with this uh, uh, situation. Uh, so um, I thought that it could be uh, useful uh, to tell you about an experience that we had in, you know, a few, few years uh, ago uh, that is still live and that could be, could give some answers to different kinds of uh, uh, problems that are so strictly uh, connected to uh, educational uh, poverty and the risk of educational uh, poverty we are facing. Um, and the project is called Digital Innovation in Cultural Heritage Education, a, a European project, as you can see, uh, is uh, an Erasmus Plus project. Um, and uh, it was uh, ac actually the extended title is there, Digital Innovation in Cultural and Heritage Education in the Light of 21st Century Learning. I will tell you more about it in a minute. Uh, different partners for European countries involved. Um, Italy uh, with two partners, Loughborough University from UK, uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, there's a, a project website there, it's still working so you can uh, go and have more information if you are interested in the project. What is the project based on? It's based on three main pillars primary school, but you know, the, the model can be applied and extended to all different uh, uh, levels of uh, instruction, digital resources, cultural and heritage uh, education. So the idea is to um, integrate uh, in, in the current learning systems, uh, new methods and technological tools in view of the development of active citizenship skills. In particular, this kind of skills developed by uh, Trilling and Fathers uh, uh, model, critical thinking, creativity, communication and collaboration. Um, through uh, this uh, this uh, lockdown and actually attending different of uh, the online together uh, webinars uh, uh, webinars program, but also the NAP uh, webinar programs. We have been listening to different uh, experts telling us about the need uh, to uh, rethink um, education. Uh, after uh, the pandemic we have been all experiencing and focusing especially on um, the development of cross-sectional skills, uh, especially critical thinking. Uh, the, the issues, the problems that we have been facing are very much related also to the impossibility 
the difficulty to manage information in the correct way, to be critical about the overload of information that we get from uh, the, the net in, in particular, but from all the channels, uh, the community communication channels that we experience every hour of our uh, day. Um, so, uh, digital resources, use of digital resources in the core, in, you know, in a critical way, uh, cultural and heritage education, um, experiencing uh, uh, these new models in primary school, but as I said, we could extend it to different kind of, uh, um, different kind of, different levels of school. Um, what we, we worked on was a research agenda, so a common theoretical framework, a, a menu of teaching scenarios. So we imagined uh, different kind of teaching scenarios where the use of digital tools and the uh, use of uh, um, heritage as a, a teaching and learning tool was foreseen. Um, and of course, uh, the idea was to improve, uh, in this sense, um, teachers' uh, professional uh, development uh, to help them use digital tools uh, within a, uh, a, a thick and important uh, cultural uh, setting. Uh, we don't have to think that this was meant just to teach uh, art or history of art or, you know, um, uh, contents connected just to heritage. No, because whatever museum object you take into consideration can be used as an object to teach uh, different kind of uh, um, of disciplines, of subjects, uh, from chemistry uh, to math uh, to any uh, scientific uh, content. So not just history of art, of course. And of course, a pilot phase was carried out. But what I wanted to tell you today is that through that uh, project, we devised, as I said, a menu of digital teaching scenarios. So imagine uh, different kind of uh, possibilities for our teachers. That was uh, a digital product of, uh, of the mm, of the project, and uh, we also devised a, a so-called MuseTech web app uh, that was made to, you know, mm, there are animations, but I want to skip it. It's a web app. It's a web app, so it's easy to manage. Uh, it's a social hub where people could and can actually is absolutely active, so you can use it. Uh, you can also rate it, and that's what uh, uh, we wanted the app to be. Um, it's a, a an app that can be uh, improved, and it improves by itself. Um, it uses, of course, the project uh, resources uh, that were created in the um, menu of scenarios. Uh, why we uh, you, we wanted a, a social rating uh, web app? First of all, because you know it's 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 a a cycle where uh, we can improve. Um, and uh, you can browse the web app, use the teacher resources, the project resources. You can, starting from that browsing and, you know, collecting the resources, create a new experience. And then uh, you can share it and the cycle restart with a new browsing, but especially a, an improvement of uh, the app. Of course, we, we think that uh, the social dimension allows final users to create new experiences which can be shared uh, socially. Uh, 
uh, here you have some screenshots from the hub, but if you connect to the link that I'm giving you in a minute, you can uh, have uh, uh, on your uh, personal device the screenshots yourself. Uh, you can have uh, uh, contents. Of course, these screenshots are in Italian, but the um, the uh, app can be available in different languages. Uh, here you have the link to the app, and uh, you can find a list of resources, as I was saying, in different languages, Italian, uh, English, and Dutch, because as you might remember, and as I mentioned, the, the uh, Netherlands component was, was strong within the consortium, and you can search specific resources according to your training and teaching needs, um, just going through the search bar length. Um, if you, uh, this is, this is, uh, 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 you know, an image uh, that can tell you, uh, can show you how to get uh, the, you know, the uh, uh, digital tool that according to a certain um, series of keywords that are uh, highlighted there, um, you can get uh, from from the app uh, a description of uh, uh, the tool that could be useful for your teaching and learning uh, session according to the keywords that you inserted in in uh, in the lens bar you see here we inserted accessible and when you type accessible there the app gives you a solution to where where to start using, for instance, the smart art application. Uh, so uh, what we did besides creating this app was also to um, assess the app to understand if the app was working and if it was um, interesting to. Um, in training primary school teachers uh, that in a way tested uh, this application. So the research questions we carried out are there. Are future teachers interested in web technologies? Which kind of opinions and expectations in training teachers have about the use of technologies for cultural heritage education? But again, I want to stress this aspect, not only cultural heritage education, but the use of cultural heritage for education, which is a very wide uh, uh, concept, uh, especially supporting cross-sectional skills and 21st century skills. We asked them to uh, download, uh, actually, uh, to to work uh, on on the uh, technologies that were available through the 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 app, and we collected comments from from them. I give you just a few, very few data regarding our survey, but just to let you know how we want to be critical in the use of technologies and also developing um, a web app like the one that was carried out uh, in, in this project. We really want to collect uh, data and to <clears throat> reflect on the data to understand if that technology is useful or not. So the Musitech app was uh, used in this first uh, activity by 170 in training teachers, and from them we collected some information. Um, of course, the web app, uh, as you can see, uh, contains, uh, um, you know, mainly 2.0, 3.0 technologies, and the uh, in training, teachers commented on, on those mainly. According to the results we collected and we analyzed, uh, you see, uh, we had, uh, um, you know, a thematic analysis, and from what we see, 
the focus on, of the interest was concentrated on VR app for Android uh, smartphones like cardboard or object-based learning and 3D printing. Uh, most frequent words used in the comments are object, uh, interesting, children's senses, useful, allows uh, students to be. So different words connected to the idea of using uh, uh, the uh, digital application to develop certain certain skills and certain certain uh, senses. Um, teams that emerged are connected to ubiquity, sensory experience, immersive experience. So the three teams are in line with the characteristics uh, provided by the uh, 3.0 uh, technologies. Uh, so um, this means that in training, teachers uh, grasp the real meaning and potential of the technologies. Um, there are some, some comments that, that I mentioned here uh, related to the fact that the tool allows you to visit places that you thought to be inaccessible. So technologies that can allow you to uh, face the problem uh, of mobility, so absolutely, uh, actually, um absolutely uh, absolutely um you know up to date and relevant to the situation we are experiencing but um i think that taking into consideration that those comments were given you know in a time where we couldn't even imagine what would have happened afterwards uh, you could really be um helped and supported by such a, uh, a, 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 an application. Um, besides the kind of uh, of uh, of uh, technologies that were mostly mostly um, appreciated by by uh, the respondents, uh, and the fact that when you talk about object based learning and three D printing, you gained a, a Best, uh, um, you know, a better, a better appreciation. Um, you can realize that uh, there are different kinds of uh, of uh, applications that can be used for your own uh, wishes. Um, why I uh, wanted to present today uh, this. Uh, um, this uh, this uh, application, this web app, and why I am presenting you this project that actually uh, ended a couple of years ago, uh, because I think it is it can be really useful, uh, practically useful for teachers, uh, for educators, for all of us. Um, because it supports uh, our awareness, it supports our uh, professional development in using technologies that we experience. It's not so widespread. The digital divide, especially in Italy, you know, was shown as a major problem during this lockdown. Uh, the possibility to use free digital uh, scenarios. Uh, the possibilities uh, provided by iPad tools, such as ubiquity, sensorial and immersive experiences. The opportunity to discuss your ideas in a community of uh, uh, peers through this social uh, web app. So different kind of uh, opportunities that uh, this product that we devised in a time, I, I was telling you, in a time that was not uh, that of the pandemic, really um, could instead be revised and reapplied in this uh, time we are we are living. So, a solution uh, to our first question related to uh, the need to be more accessible from different points of views. So, before. Uh, leaving the floor to Paul, who I think will tell us 
uh, about the, the solution they found at, at Stanford. Uh, I know you're all there waiting for for uh, our VIP. Uh, I'm asking if you have any questions uh, for me. Of course, I can give you all the uh, the um, different uh, uh, links to our web app, but it, the links are there in the presentation, so you can access it later if you wish. Thank you. Yeah, there were. Uh, Dorot, I wanted uh, to get links to your articles that you quoted at the beginning of the session. Maybe you could do that when Paul's talking in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when Paul's could, talking, uh, I, I can yeah. give you the links. Yeah. Yes. And the Irina was wondering uh, who is holding governments responsible when they do not provide funding. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah, I was, the, uh, I was, I was reading, and so yeah. <laughs> sufficient funding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is the issue. So, uh, in fact, uh, we, 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 as I was saying, uh, there's uh, the possibility to work bottom up. Uh, besides, you know, waiting for support from the government that sometimes come, sometimes not, um, and uh, this kind of uh, application is uh, really bottom up i mean it's free it's available uh, you don't need to download it you know it's just uh, accessible by itself and uh, especially is meant to be social so that you can share with other teachers uh, teachers educators or you know people who are in the same need as yours to discuss together uh, the, um, the the need the, the educational need you have and to find uh, other free solutions because the app is organized in a way that uh, giving them the problem as I was showing you accessibility it gives you back uh, solutions with uh, the kind of uh, um, of uh, mm, uh, digital tools that you can use. Uh, here is the the image uh, that you can use to uh, answer that specific issue, accessibility in this case, and uh, the uh, application uh, uh, gives you the answer to use smart art. Of course, you can rate this this application, and you can uh, you can uh, uh, comment on that together with other peers. Um, okay. I don't know if there's there are a lot of questions coming in now in the chat, and I suggest Antonella that you answer them in yeah. the chat. Yeah, and yeah, we, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, we we, we, we leave the floor to Paul. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing from Paul, who is a, a dear friend, and I'm so glad that he is here with us today. Thank you so much. Okay, okay Paul. We yeah. hit the virus, but we value the innovation trigger it created to our generation. Thank you all for your interest and effort to make a difference together. Can you uh, restart the lecture, please? You're looking at a photo of Afghanistan girls in Kabul. As many of you know, the struggles these children had to face from their birth to today are unimaginable. And they are still facing numerous challenges. The one most disheartening problem they are facing as we speak right now is their threatened right to education. On top of what has been challenged for them for decades with all time uncertainty, COVID-19 happened. Due to the uh, current pandemic, their access to education has been completely shattered. When we complain about Zoom fatigue from so many Zoom meetings and classes, these students in Afghanistan have nowhere to go to continue to learn 
because their schools are all closed. In the midst of this chaotic situation, I received an email from one of my colleagues at Stanford asking me to meet a student who might join Stanford University as a graduate student. I learned that the student is an Afghanistan female who has been admitted to Stanford, Harvard, and Berkeley, yet she has not made up her mind. My job was to convince her that Stanford is the right university for her. As I learned about her by having a Zoom meeting, I began to be really impressed. She has shown a tremendous interest in helping young Afghanistan girls get an education. And in fact, she has traveled to several informal learning centers in and out of Kabul and helped teach young students. Currently, since all the schools are closed, she's communicating with her students via WhatsApp. Every week, she reads and records storybooks and shares her audio files along with the storybook files to their mobile phones. What an incredible use of technology. She has been providing the children with a basic education program to fight the crisis. And she asked me what she can expect to learn from our graduate program so she can apply to her lifelong passion for educating children in marginalized regions like Afghanistan, where these girls' right to education is threatened. I ensured that she would learn the big picture of education inequality around the globe with international comparative data sets and seminar works by notable researchers and partnering organizations. Then she asked me what I have been doing in the developing regions. So I began to explain what I have been doing in the past, how I put together mobile learning technology for indigenous migrant children working in farms in Mexico, also how I partnered with global organizations to expand my mobile learning projects such as Pocket School to help develop entrepreneurship skills for girls in rural India, and how I conducted research studies by traveling with graduate students and implementing literacy and numeracy programs in Africa. And also how I deployed mobile learning technology to assess executive functioning skills of children in conflict zones such as Palestine. And lastly, how I developed an inquiry-based mobile learning program named SMILE with funding from UNESCO and other organizations to expand in different countries around the world. She asked me how I handle the places where there is no reliable access to electricity or internet. So I explained about smilepie.org project and its solution, which uses a $35 Raspberry Pi loaded with Smile Learning Management System, Wikipedia, Khan Academy, K-12 digital curriculum set, four computer coding schools, and STEM-related virtual laboratories. The SmilePi runs on portable batteries, and it is your Wi-Fi, router, storage, and content, everything in one small box. No reliable electricity or internet is needed in this case. She then asked me if we could deploy Smile mobile learning project in Afghanistan right now. So I asked her, you mean right now? And she said, yes, right now, because there is no schooling right now. I said, why not? Then she started to come up with plans to train local friends to serve as facilitators and line up weekly educational content with specific schedules. As we speak right now, she has been teaching her students and sending me progress reports every week. I have to remind you that she hasn't even started her class at Stanford, and yet she's making a difference already in the lives of many students in Afghanistan right now through a mobile learning model. Anyway, she has decided to join Stanford over Harvard and Berkeley this fall. I feel good about that. But more importantly, I feel great that there are individuals out there who want to make a difference for the children who are in dire need of access to education. Also, I'm glad that young millennials are seeking to join universities because they have a genuine passion 
for making an impact in our society, not because they won a piece of paper degree. If you look closely at what happened here, perhaps you may find a glimpse of the future of a higher education model, where young students meet with coaches, where knowledge and experiences are shared, and solutions are designed and evaluated to address real-world problems. In fact, this is not new at all. A while ago, I taught a MOOC named Designing a New Learning Environment, which invited 20,000 students from 170 different countries to come up with a new innovative designs to solve numerous education problems. In this massive class, every student had to be working in teams to identify, design, and evaluate solutions that address real-world problems. Did I evaluate all 20,000 students' work? Nope. The platform had a machine learning algorithm developed to provide students with simulated evaluation experiences so they can turn around and evaluate their peers' work as if I were personally evaluating everyone's work. This kind of MOOC is a scaled up a version for coaching young individuals globally. This kind of learning environment is just one of the many things that people like me are trying to experiment as an attempt to innovate education. In addition, the rapid development of artificial intelligence is just waiting around the corner to add a whole new dimension to the education ecosystem. I'm personally involved in developing an AI-backed coaching companion that can engage in conversations with the students and encouraging them to improve their personal inquiries. The difference between a human teacher and AI coach is that the machine never forgets a single word or question a student has ever mentioned. This is going to be revolutionary. Now let's step back and come to reality today. Regardless of COVID-19, many of the innovation attempts have already been made and many things have already been tried. However, these weren't valued much because there was always an offline option and people didn't want to invest time to learn new models involving technology or online environments when things seemed acceptable as always have been. Now with COVID-19, the all-time available offline model is no longer an ideal option as of today. The use of online education environments skyrocketed in developed countries. In developing regions, a tool like WhatsApp is a dominant learning management system for now. Nonetheless, there is an unprecedented level of training development and collaboration to launch and improve online learning environments rapidly. A lot of earlier research studies around online education are now coming back to the main stage discussions. It feels like we're going back to the future very fast. If COVID-19 lingers around long, the rate of development and innovation in education technology will probably accelerate at a rate we have never seen. Here's a word of caution, though. As more online education is becoming a norm, schools and universities will have to figure out how to structure a better coaching system, not a lecture delivery system. Coaching means understanding students much better at an individual level and guiding them and motivating them to achieve their full potential. If you're still thinking of running a school or university by converting offline lectures into streaming videos and easing academic requirements, you're on the wrong track. You want to challenge your students based on their interests and skills with much more rigorous experiential education programs linked to solving real world problems. This way, we'll be able to involve students from Afghanistan to Rwanda and from Seoul to Silicon Valley to work together to address grand challenges in a global team. And that's how I see the future of education. I hope my presentation has given you some useful ideas to design future learning environments for your students. We'll certainly remember this period in human history as one of the most invigorating times of innovation. This time of now is a new renaissance moment in education and we do not want to waste this crisis. 
We hate the virus, but we value the innovation trigger it created to our generation. Thank you all for your interest and effort to make a difference together. Okay, so I'm sure people uh, have questions. So I would love to uh, yeah. answer them. Uh, with cool. them First of all, well. let me, you know, Alistair will thank you as well, but let me thank you first of all for your presentation and really for uh, the inspiring, uh, you know, hints and suggestions that we can get from your presentation. Uh, there are different questions. Uh, one is uh, you know, the one that, that I really share with, uh, with Julian. So what do you think? What should we do where we don't have uh, um, uh, the possibility to access uh, the band, with, where we don't have internet? Uh, what can we do to uh, support uh, uh, pupils and to limit this educational poverty risk. You have been working in so many places around the world where this problem is has always been there. So please tell us what to do. We have to think of a, a few scenarios and conditions. I suspect that this coronavirus will be lingering around for a very long time. I don't think it's going away yeah. anytime soon. And what I have been doing is I've been calling various partners in various countries to see what's working right now. And what I'm hearing from Africa, India, and Afghanistan, and many other countries is that they're all using WhatsApp. And uh, that, that's the main delivery system right now. Or the schools are completely closed. In, in some cases in Africa, I heard that the parents have to stop by the school to get some printouts for the homework so that they can take it home and kids uh, work on them. So in the, in the developing regions, the, lim the options are quite limited, but right now, the, uh, if you can think of any technology-based solu solution, what that has been the, uh, the incredible uh, learning management system. Fortunately, working with partners in a few other countries, I am uh, introducing the uh, SMILE project, the SMILE mobile learning management system so that they can have a more formally structured education program using SMILE. For developed countries like Korea or uh, US and Singapore, we are using a lot of Zoom. We have, uh, uh, like uh, even if you are in first grade, they are having 30 minute Zoom sessions four times a day. And uh, using the Zoom uh, for live session, and then they are using other tools like some sort of e-portfolio system for students to complete their work and upload them. So things are going, I mean, they are not ideal because everything just happened. So every, everyone had to rush to creating something that works for now. So it's a little chaotic and transitional. But if the virus lingers around more, probably people will have to think of more permanent solutions. And those permanent solutions, I'm sure, uh, will depend on the conditions that you are in, in your region. So if you're interested in learning more about best practices for different parts of the world, let me know the region and the conditions. Then we can probably help you figure out what will be the best solution. That, that would be great. I think that if you, uh, you know, if... Uh participants today but also those who will access this uh, presentation afterwards uh, because the, the recording will be put on our website and many people normally access it also afterwards if uh, you have problems if you uh, you are based in far remote areas uh, please contact Paul I'm sure that he will be glad to 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 involve you in in his wonderful wonderful projects, um, Paul. They are saying here in the chat that the 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 sites can't be reached, but I think it's uh, uh, 
strange because I, I know those websites and I I accessed them previously. I don't know, Paul, if you want to have a check. And also, uh, oh yes, the Smile uh, project is, is there in the link uh, Paul gave us. Uh, another question that is here and, uh, and that I, I, I want to share with you. What do you think about using TV channels? This is something that also in Italy has been promoted as a way to reach uh, children and, uh, you know, pupils uh, based in places where, where the, the, the connection is not working. Right, so uh, developing countries are uh, deploying TV programs, but uh, some countries already have been doing that anyway. So if you look at Korea, Singapore, and countries like that, they have had their education broadcast systems for decades. And uh, even if you don't go to school at all, you can watch TV programs, and then it covers the entire uh, uh, K-12 curriculum through the TV program. So. I don't think that we need to worry about those countries that, that have all those resources, but the, we, we probably need to worry about the countries that do not have all those resources, and, and uh, we, we probably need to innovate uh, solutions for those regions that may not have a reliable electricity or internet. The rest right. of the world, I, I think they have some sort of a, a resources that could be utilized. So uh, my, my concerns are for more for the developing regions. Exactly, exactly. And you have been there yourself. Can you tell us, because I'm always, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by your, your experiences. Can you tell us about your, your travels? Um, I remember you told me different, different uh, episodes, but can you tell me where you, can you tell us, all of us, uh, One, one memory uh, of, your, of your travels in far remote places to bring education there. So these days I am working more with large uh, organizations like edify.org, uh, which has about one million students under their belt. They're operating in 10 different countries. Uh, I, I'm sharing the link below here. Uh, so I, I, these days I'm not traveling as much. I mean, obviously I can't travel right now, but as soon as the, the shelter in place uh, lifts up, then I'll probably yeah. begin traveling again. But I, I'm doing a lot of uh, lectures online. I am uh, invited uh, for conferences like this in many different places around the world. So everything yeah, is online. Cool. It's kind of convenient in a way because I don't have to, you know, fly 12 hours, 16 hours to get to a different place. But obviously, I miss the real people and then um, meeting people on, on ground. So right now, I'm working with the large organizations because um, I cannot be there. Uh, no, that's, that's fine. I just wanted to have a, 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 you know, a memory of yours when you travel to these far remote places where you brought education through, you know, small devices. Yeah, so uh, if you look at the smilepie.org website, which I shared here, uh, there are, yeah. uh, it kind of explains how you can make your own smile pie with all the content that I mentioned. It has not only the mobile learning management system, but it is an open education resource. Smilepie.org is an open source. So you can make yourself own smile pie today if you want to with the $35 Raspberry Pi. So uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to share these open source uh, uh, products and services to you know, places where, where they, their resources are limited so that they can make their own smile pie if they want to, like right now. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, amazing, and I really thank you. There's uh, uh, Pankai asking, smile promote OERs. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, we work with organizations that, are, uh, that have the specific content from OER and they like to put them in, in the uh, Smile Pie, then we help them do that as well. Wow, fantastic. So uh, I really thank you, Paul. I can say, and I really uh, agree with Dalida, who's saying that you combine passion and knowledge, and that's 
has always been my my you know my thought regarding your your work so that's that's exactly uh what Paul is doing is working with passion and and knowledge thank you so much but it was very interesting thank you i don't know alastair if you want to because we we are reaching the end yeah if you were if you the thanks paul that was uh, really inspirational there were one there was one, i think there was one one or two people who were having trouble uh, hearing it at the beginning but that solved itself in the end luckily so uh, very inspirational and if you missed anything i think the link is in paul's uh, chat there so you can go back and hear it and you can hear the recording uh, that will be released very very soon to everybody uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar uh, I just thought just below here, there's a little poll. Yeah, what have you, is there anything you've learned that will be valuable in the future? Maybe write down some ideas just now, uh, just right there, and we'll see if there's what, what you've taken from this. Also, uh, a lot of the open universities in the world, in many developing countries, uh, visited the one in Pakistan and in Palestine, and many other countries, they, they work with a combination of local support centres where the students can go to get on-site support, and they also work with this, uh, as you mentioned, the um, radio and TV broadcasting. Uh, many of them have their own TV stations and they get uh, broadcast rights on air, uh, which is, is quite impressive. So they do reach out. So there's a lot of interesting work going on. Yeah, there's a lot, uh, because as we said, if, if these... Uh, this virus is not going to leave us soon. We we really need to engage our brains and find new solutions. Okay. Uh, lots of food for thought. Thanks to Antonella and to Paul. Uh, way over there in Thank California. I uh, hope you have uh, a pleasant day, the rest of the day. The rest of us, it's heading into the evening for many of us in Europe. And is there anything else we should say before we finish, Antonella? Is it uh, the the badges? I was just yeah, yeah, yeah. You you need to sign for getting the the badges uh, because every time you attend one of our uh, of our, our events, sorry, uh, you get a badge. So there's a a recognition of uh, of the work you've done with us and we have done all together actually uh, and don't forget our annual conference that will take place from june 21st to june 24th uh, hosted by timisoara polytechnica university um, and uh, uh, of course it will go online but we will have nice, nice uh, shots of Timisoara, which is a wonderful cultural heritage site, talking about cultural heritage. And I really wish we will be able to all together to be online at the conference, but also to visit Timisoara and Polytechnica uh, University, uh, Timisoara which is a, a very up-to-date and, uh, uh, you know, innovative place to be and to grow. So thank you to all of you. Thank you, Paul, again. Thank yeah. you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you.